Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. I love the sound of your voices in this room. Uh, let's begin in prayer. Father, we spend uh, just a, a moment of acknowledging um, that you are good, that you are our God, our creator, our master, and that we give you our full attention for the next few minutes. Um, we know that this world that we live in is full of distraction and uh, attention grabbing, and we just want to give you um, ourselves to hear, to listen, to be changed, um, transformed into the likeness of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray, and everybody said together, amen. amen. If you have a Bible, go with me to the book of Mark as we continue. We'll take a break for the next few weeks, but this is our last week in Mark of this year, but Mark chapter 10 and we'll start picking up right where we left off in verse 17. This is on Jesus' journey. As he was setting out, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. I really like that one now that I'm a dad. Uh, and he said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. What we are witnessing, especially in this ancient Israelite world that Jesus is working in, is this collision of this coming kingdom that's happening. Jesus keeps talking about this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God. And the kingdom, as we've discussed before, is defined in, uh, by which an age in which all that Yahweh is and desires takes place on planet earth, where he rules and reigns, where everything is right, where God is ruling on planet Earth, this kingdom where Yahweh's will is done. In fact, when he comes up to Jesus in verse 17, runs up, kneels before him and asks, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A better translation would not have been, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a very Western phrase. We want to live forever. We have songs about living forever, right? The real translation would better have been translated, what must I do to go into this age that is coming? See, for the Jews, they were on this precipice. They were on this transition of, here's the age we have now, and then there's this age to come. There's this age where, where Yahweh is coming, where he will reestablish his kingdom on planet Earth, where Israel will be the center of the universe, and God will restore everything that they have lost. And so this young man comes to Jesus, kneels before him, calls him good, and says, what must I do in this age to come. He may even, being a wealthy young person, have been asking, Jesus, how should I position myself investment-wise, this may be time or money or with my influence, how should I position myself in order to benefit the most in the age that is coming? You know what's next, Jesus. You're speaking of this kingdom. What do I have to do? And maybe it's just being a male or maybe it's just being married or in any relationship. But I find myself 
um, being a different person than my wife. We had a conversation with some friends about it this week of how everything I am is very practical. Just tell me what to do. That's how I think. Just tell me what you want me to do or what you want me to say or how you want me to act or just tell me where to sign. I'm a doer. I like things that are practical and actionable. Or my wife is a thinker. Everything happens in her mind. Everything is emotional. And I'm like, how was your day? And she'll be like, I felt like this today. And she asks me, how was your day? And I'll say, I did this today. Can anybody relate with me as far as uh, maybe, maybe it's male, female, maybe it's just we're different people. I'm not really sure. But that is my experience. But what I find more often than not when we're in disagreement or maybe we're just not connecting is I'll just come to her and I'll say, just tell me what you want. Like, just, just tell me what to do. You know, you're playing the emotional games and, and she's like, these aren't games. This is my life. And I'm like, no, I don't understand you. Just tell me what to do. That is this young man. All three synoptic gospels cover this story, defining him as the rich young ruler. He has money. He has power. He has influence. He is a religious young Man, And he's coming to Jesus and his question isn't, hey, Jesus, how do I make my feelings all line up or how do I set this all right? He's saying, tell me what to do. What it is indicative of to me as I read this story is even with all that he had, money, wealth, influence, power, and his religion, even with all of it, he knew something was missing. Something's not right. Jesus says, well, you know the law. And there's two tables of the law. The first five commandments in the Old Testament are your relationship to God, right? No other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath. Don't use my name in vain. That's your connection to God. The second five are your connection to others. We call those the neighborly commandments, the second table of the law. And Jesus repeats those to him. You you know the, the commandments. Don't murder. Anybody here murdered? Don't commit adultery. Anybody here willing to admit that publicly? Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Do not defraud and honor your father and your mother. The young man's probably relieved at this moment because he can attest, at least publicly, I've never been at least found guilty of those things. No one could ever accuse me of those things and find me guilty. And he says, oh, I kept all of those since I was little. It's almost as if he's saying, is that all? That's all I, I have to do? I've done all of that since I was a little boy. I have kept the law. I've done it all. But why is there this inkling deep in my soul that something yet is still missing? I believe... It is because as human beings, Solomon put it this way, God has placed something called eternity in our hearts. There will always be this inkling that something's not exactly right. Something's not exactly lining up. Even when I do everything right and check all of the boxes and keep all of the law like this young Israelite man had, he knew something's missing. The law was designed even when we keep it fully and in its entirety to drive us to Jesus. And that's exactly what has happened. So Jesus responds to him. Just tell me what to do, he says. And Jesus says, first off, let's get across the semantics here. Look at verse 18. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I do not think that Jesus... Is, is telling the young man, I'm not good. What I think Jesus is trying to do is ask him the question, you're calling me good, but in relation to what? Just last night, my wife is petting our dog, and, and we're sitting there, we're watching Elf with uh, uh, Will Ferrell, and the kids are laughing, and the, the dog's being pet, and we have this big, hairy, slobbery, golden doodle, and um, I had just come home, and he's barking at me, like I live here, bro. This is my house. And he's barking at me as I open the front door, and I'm annoyed with him. And then he comes and sits on me, and I'm like, okay, get away. And Rachel's there petting the dog. She's like, oh, Murray, you're such a good dog. And I said, good in relation to what? Like, good in relation to all the other dogs you've ever met on planet Earth? And she's like, I just think he's a good dog. Why are you being mean to the dog? And I'm like, I'm not being mean, but we need to define what goodness is. And that's what Jesus is trying to do here. He's like, why are you calling me? Good. No one is good except for 
God, what he is dismantling is this young man's belief that he himself is also good. Because we can define goodness all day long in relation to how bad other people are. Isn't that how it works? We'll say things like, I'm a good man, or I'm a good mom, or you know, I'm a good employee, or I'm a good boss. Yeah, in our own definition of goodness, as it relates to everyone else we've experienced, and the bad bosses, and the bad parents, and the bad moments that we've all shared, right? We can define our own goodness based on everyone else's badness. And what Jesus is getting at is, well, when you compare yourself to God, there's no one good. I remember I was hanging out with a, a mentor of mine, and we went and we found out about this church rummage sale. And now let me let you in on the secret of church rummage sales. Okay, you can find the best deals at church rummage sales. I don't know what it is about it, but I find some of my best deals there, and we found out there's a big, giant church rummage sale. In fact, my mom emailed me about it because she knows I'm all in to the church rummage sale game. And so I, I was with my mentor. We were having coffee, and I said, hey, can we? Do you mind going to a church rummage sale? And I was kind of embarrassed. You know when you have something and you're like, that doesn't sound very cool. And he goes, ooh, they have the best books. And I'm like, yes, they have the best books. So we jump in the car and we get there. And I'm walking around the church rummage sale. And we run into my grandmother. And I'm like, Grandma Jane, how are you? And I'm like, this is, this is my friend. This is my mentor. Um, this, is, this is my grandmother. And he goes, he reaches out and takes her by the hand. And he goes, it's really nice to meet you. And he goes, I love your grandson. He's a good man. And I'm like, you know, this is a moment where I'm like, this is cool. You know what I mean? And my grandma goes, no one is good except God. <laughs> and, and he goes, you're right, ma'am. And we walk away and my spirit is crushed. And I know that she's the good Christian woman who just wanted to have that saying. But I'm like, but I think I'm a generally good guy. Like she could have given me just that, that moment this is the exact same way I imagine this young man felt as he sets out to follow Jesus. He runs after him in the road. He humbles himself before him, falls down on the ground and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom that is coming, to be a part of what is next? And Jesus goes, why are you calling me good? Your definition of goodness is flawed. And I still believe that 2,000 years later, our definition of goodness is still flawed. The people will say, I'm a good person, right? Isn't that the standard of being in heaven? Be a good person. I'm not a bad person. I've never cheated. I've never stolen. I've never murdered. Congratulations, you have kept the three easiest things to keep in the law of God. But Jesus goes, raises the standards in the Sermon on the Mount, and he goes, you haven't committed adultery? Great. That's awesome. I say if you've even looked at someone else with a lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery. Oh, you've never committed murder? Congratulations. That's pretty much the easiest one to do. I say if you hate someone in your heart, then you've already committed murder in your heart and are guilty of it against God. Jesus raises these standards. What is he doing? He's telling us that our own moral value system is flawed and that only when we measure ourselves against God can we all willingly admit that there is no one who is truly good do you remember Isaiah Isaiah chapter 6 he sees God in all of his glory he's having the vision the angels are singing and he falls down unravels himself and says woe is me I am a man of unclean lips. Why? Because he just saw God for who he really, truly was. And Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets and mouthpieces of God in human history. But in comparison to Yahweh, in the holiest of moments, he says, I am just undone. Your goodness may feel like goodness when your measuring stick is humanity at its whole. But our goodness never feels like goodness in relation and comparison to God. D.L. Moody put it this way. He said, the law tells me how crooked I am. And grace comes along and straightens me out. Jesus looking at him, verse 21, he said, you lack one thing. You've kept the law, you've kept the commandments, at least according to you. Now, I'm kind of going to pause here for a second and ask the question, okay, Jesus, got a young guy, chases you down, 
you know, falls to his knees, calls you good. He's doing the flattery game. He says he's kept all the laws. If I'm Jesus and I know everything, I would have at that moment chosen to humiliate the poor fellow, right? Like, you've kept all the laws. Oh, what about in third grade? You know what I mean? Like, I would have just, like, went and peaced. Picked him apart. Oh, do you remember that one time you looked at that girl? Remember the one time you thought this in your heart? And I would have exposed him for who he was. Instead, Jesus goes, oh, good. You've kept all the law? Okay, just one more thing. I feel like this is the, the drum roll moment. He's excited. He's in, there's an anticipatory, anticipatory spirit about him. Uh, he's at the feet of Jesus. Something good could come. Just one more thing I could do. Just one more thing. I've kept the law. I, I've done it. I've come all the way to this moment. You lack one thing. One more thing. Go sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. I don't know if you're noticing this right now. But uh, Jesus is inviting a 13th disciple. This is not just a general, hey, you can join the crowds and the multitudes that are following me around. This is a very specific invitation to this young rich ruler. You can be the 13th of all of us. Come on and join. You know, Peter and James and John, who are just arguing amongst themselves of who's the greatest, are like, Jesus just invited this guy? And there's either two sides of this. Either they're mad, like, hey, we're the 12th, or they're really excited because this guy's got a million Instagram followers. He is rich. He is young. He is influential. He's a leader. This could actually help this cause of Jesus and he says you have one more thing to do go home sell it all distribute it to the poor you'll have treasure in heaven and then you come and join us verse 22 describes the young man's condition disheartened disheartened by the saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions I love Jesus' countenance towards the young, rich ruler. It says, looking at him, he loved him. It's as if Jesus could see the potential that existed in the eagerness and the ardent heart of a young Israelite man. Oh, I love this kid. Just one more thing, bud. Go sell it all. And your new job is going to be giving it all away. To the poor and then when you're done with that you can join our crew you can join the group the treasure you've stored up here all that you have amassed all that you have earned all that you've gained will do you no good in the kingdom that is coming timothy keller put it this way he said jesus smashed two of the rich young rulers assumptions that christianity is something you can add on and that Christianity is something you can do. Something you can just tack on. Isn't that what we want? That's what American Christianity has become. It is tacking on. Oh, I can follow Jesus just two hours on a Sunday morning? That's awesome. I'll just add that on. I'll just put that on the end of my resume. I'll just add that to the to-do list. I just want to get that Sunday morning out of the way. And, oh, and, and even us who get a little more into following Jesus. Oh, I can just add on a, a morning devotional. That's what we call them. We call them devos, quiet times when I grew up in church. If you just do that, then, then God and you are good. And we just like adding on, tacking on what it means to follow Jesus because we can do that. And then we have also do this thing where we create a system in by which what we do, what we produce our productivity, our performance dictates our relationship to God. Jesus dismantles both of those belief systems in his commandment to the young man. Following me is not just another thing you can add to your to-do list. It means abandoning the entire list and taking up just me. And following me is not something that you can just do. You're a doer. You've kept the law. In fact, bud, you might have kept it all. But even keeping all of the law, you are still in need of my mercy and my grace. Why? Because following Jesus is not a life of achievement. That's called the American dream. It's definitely not God's dream. Where we achieve and we earn and we grow and we expand and we move and everything is about breakthrough in the next level. That is not the life of the Jesus follower. The life of the Jesus follower is not one of achieving. It's one of receiving. 
It's one of saying, okay, God, here I am, and in comparison to you, I am not good, and so I just want to receive your mercy, receive your grace. Why is the command of Jesus for this young man to go and give it all away, I believe, not because Jesus has anything against possessions. He doesn't have anything against money. His problem is not that he has money or this young man has possessions, but that money and possessions had this young man. What's the condition of your hands today? Jesus is like, hey, you can come and follow me, but I need you to go and open your hand, let go of all that you've earned and achieved and all that you have amassed and accumulated, release it so that when you come back to me, I can put some stuff in your hand, treasure in your hand that you can take into this coming kingdom, that you can take into this coming age that I am ushering in, that we're all about to culminate at the cross in Jerusalem. But his hands are closed now. He wanted Jesus just to tell him what to do. Sinclair Ferguson put it this way, our salvation is all of grace. And the one thing, like Jesus required of him, necessary is the one thing we ourselves cannot perform. Isn't performance how we dictate our entire life? The measure of how good of a parent you are is how well you performed. The measure of how good of a student you are is how well you've performed. The measure of how good of an athlete you are is how well you've performed. The measure of, the, of, of your fellowship of Jesus and your discipleship and apprenticeship of Jesus is never your performance. It is all his grace. It is all his mercy. But we live in a world predicated on performance. And Jesus goes, hey man, everything you've performed and earned, just go give it away. Because it's not going to help you on the other side. It's not going to help you if you want to follow me. It'll help you in the world. It'll help you with your influence. It'll help you with the chips that you have on your shoulder. It will help you gain and accumulate and amass. But those things cannot come with you in the kingdom I am ushering in. And he looked around his disciples as a young man walks away disappointed. As a pastor, I struggle Because I want people to come into the settings, especially when we're preaching or come into a coffee date with me or whatever, and I want them to walk away feeling fulfilled and excited and motivated. And in fact, so many of us pastors over the year have fallen into the temptation of not only the, the, the need to be liked, but the need to inspire to such a degree that we forget that quite often people would come to the feet of Jesus or be under the words and voice of Jesus himself and walk away disappointed. My job, like Jesus' job, is not so that you can walk away feeling good, but so that you can walk away having heard the truth. And for this young man, the truth was all that you do and perform and achieve in the sight of Jesus himself is nothing. But if you're willing to go let all that go and lose your life, you could actually find something much more fulfilling you just lack one thing he turns around his disciples as a young man walks away disappointed and he says these words how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of god and verse 24 and the disciples were amazed at his words this confused me until i did the research ancient hebrews believed that wealth was a sign of god's favor They believed that those who were wealthy and powerful and influential had found favor in the sight of God. And so there's no wonder now that disciples are not only amazed, but then immediately respond in verse 26 and go, "Uh, then who could be saved? If the guys who got all the money and the supposed favor of God aren't going to make it, what chance do we stand We're just following you around at the mercy of whatever food you can multiply because you're good at that, Jesus. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. What is Jesus dismantling now? He is redefining what it means to be blessed. He is redefining what it means to find favor with God. Favor is not something you earn. 
Not with God, at least. Good grace is not something you earn, not with God, at least. In fact, he redefines favor as grace, which is unmerited favor, undeserved favor. I'm trying to, trying to wonder what this young man's thoughts would have been as he walked away. And we've all watched the documentaries, right? We, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes. We're talking about a man who had all of the wealth, all of the women, all of the influence, and all of the power on planet Earth, and he writes a book of satire about how sad his life was. And it's in the Bible. And we watch the documentaries of all the rappers and the, and the actors and the politicians who have all the wealth and all of the power and all of the glory. And what do they say at the end of it? Money can't buy you happiness. And all of us poor people are on this side of the screen going, but we, at least let us try. You know, like, at least give me a shot to, to see if this could, could work out. Maybe it didn't work out for you, but, but maybe we could try. Why? Because we don't learn. And something deep inside of us tells us that money or power or influence or, or, or wealth or achievement will eventually Fulfill, and Solomon at the end of his days says, I have achieved, I have amassed, I have influenced the entire world, and it was all in vanity, vain, like a popping soap bubble, there for a second, and gone, meaningless. He wraps it all up to say, so what is the meaning of life? He says, fear God, honor the king, and eat, drink, and be merry. How does he boil it all down to that? He boils it all down to redefining blessing. Food in your stomach, a roof over your head, family and friends, a God who loves you. Jesus' countenance, looking at this young man, he says, and looking at him, he just loved him. It's almost as if this moment was significant enough for that little passage to be there. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Every time I've ever preached this passage, I end it with the young man walking away disappointed. And, and then as preachers, we get, you know, real emotional. The piano comes up. Somebody starts playing. Every, we tug in everybody's heartstrings, and we tell them, you know, are you going to let go? And are you going to be generous? And are you going to give? And nothing you have is worth, you know, giving up. And you're hanging over the precipice of hell and fire. And we do all those things to manipulate the masses. But I did a little more praying on this one this time. And, and something popped out that was so significant to me that now I just have to share it with you. And uh, it got me very emotional, but I learned that in the early church, the tradition of the rich young ruler found in all three synoptic gospels was attributed to someone. That yeah, in the gospel it says the rich young ruler, but the early church all understood it to be a specific person. And I never knew that. And what is so significant to me is verse 21, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Like, who was there? Like, Mark wasn't there. So Peter's account, like, Peter's account was, oh, Jesus looked at the guy, and, and he just loved him. Like, well, that doesn't make sense. In antiquity, in the early church, the belief system, at least the rumor, was that the rich young ruler was John Mark, the writer of Mark. That the rich young ruler who walked away disappointed was John Mark himself. This is his own account. Jesus looking at me, his countenance towards me. He loved me and he told me I lack just one thing to go and sell all I have to give it to the poor so that I'll have treasure in heaven to come and to follow him. I was disheartened by that saying and I went away sorrowful for I had great possessions and Jesus said how difficult it would be for those who had wealth to enter the kingdom of God and they said to him then who can be saved Jesus looking at him said with man it is impossible but not with God for all things are possible with God what's the story Mark went and dealt with his one thing yeah, the story looks like he went around, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. But, but, but in the early church, it was understood that he went and did what Jesus told him to do, came back and told the story of Jesus in its entirety for the whole world, even us in Albuquerque or Corrales, 2,000 years later, reading this. Why? Because Jesus looked at him and he loved him. He looks at him and goes, 
I love you. Yes, Mark may have been more, more than likely been the rich young ruler, but I came with a special message for you today. You and I are the rich young ruler. You can't connect with Jesus. Maybe you connect with Peter because in the next very next breath, Peter goes, hey, well, we left everything and followed you, Jesus. And he's like, yeah, and there'll be treasure waiting for you, Peter. Shut up, you know. <laughs> but I'm not Peter in this story. I- I'm the rich young ruler. Because I have my one thing. And you have your one thing. And, and there's probably, as I even just said that, something popped in your head that you know that you know that you know. You've convinced yourself that if I just hang on to this dream or this potential or this amount of money, or if I can just achieve this, then I'll be happy. And Jesus goes, you got to let go of that one thing because none of that is going to fulfill you. And none of it you can take with you into this coming kingdom. And all of us have the one thing. You know, and now I know that you know that there's a one thing we all have. And I'm the rich young ruler, and you're the rich young ruler. Bonhoeffer said, the strategy of every rich young ruler is to keep asking questions to Jesus in order to avoid obedience to Jesus. I just want to know, God, how do I work my way back into your good graces, back into your favor? God, are we good? Should I pray more? Should I give more? Should I, should I serve more? Should I tell others more? Should I, should I repent more? God, what do, you, what do you want me to do? And Jesus looks at us, and he just loves us. Like, I love you. You ever looked at your kids that way? Where you're like, they could be the most honorary, their most honorary moment. They could be on the floor throwing a fit. And as a dad, I just look at it and go, oh, I just love you. I want to shake you, but I love you. That's Jesus of the rich young ruler, and I believe that's Jesus with you today. The law can't save you, bud. Keeping all the rules and all the regulations, amassing all of the wealth and all of the influence and and all of the power will never fulfill the void in your heart. All the law can do for you is lead you right back to me where grace is easily accessible. What is he telling This young, rich ruler, he's telling him, you can't drive two cars at the same time, bud. One author said, you can't sail two boats. Why? Because eventually something's going to split in one direction or the other. Elijah, the prophet, stands on Mount Carmel, looks at the entire nation of Israel who was serving Yahweh and Baal at the same time. And he said, how long can you waver between two opinions, jump from branch to branch as to which God is which God? He said, if God, Yahweh is God, then follow him. And if Baal's God, then you follow him. But no man can serve, Jesus said, two masters. And that is the moment he is having with the rich, young ruler. You can't drive two cars. You got to leave that one thing. Maybe it's for you. It's a dream. And it might even sound like a good dream. I want my family to be whole and healthy. I want to retire with X amount. I want to take care of my children. I want to build this or achieve that or finish that, whatever. And it might even sound like a good thing. But if you've convinced yourself that that one thing will finally fulfill you you're wrong and are you willing to leave that one thing in order to follow Jesus Ephesians chapter 2 and I'll close with this thought now God has us where he wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Jesus saving is all his idea and all his work All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging about, uh, bragging that, that we did the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. The good work he has gotten ready for us to do. And work we had better be doing. Can I pray for you today? Father, I pray that if there's anyone in this room or anyone watching on YouTube today who has it in their mind that your countenance towards them is that of an angry creator, that you would break through that false thought and ideal today. 
that they would know in their heart of hearts that you, Jesus, who was from the beginning and has established a new kingdom, looks at all of us and loves us. That he looks at us and all of our ambition, he looks at us and all of our dreams, and he looks at us and all of our, our suffering and our pain, and he loves us. God, we know the one thing, maybe we have multiple things that we got to put out in order to follow you. All the other, th the, the things that we're hoping will fulfill, help us leave them and know that only you fulfill. Only you give what is good. And on our best day, we couldn't measure up. The law, the commandments, all the legalism, all of the rules that we've broken. May they lead us to the feet of Jesus to go home to contemplate what you've asked of us and then to go tell the world how you looked at us, how it changed us, and how good you are in spite of us. We thank you. Give us grace. Help us receive it. Dismantle any belief system that achieving is our job. In Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. amen. Hey, a few things.